racing cars used to live very long lives. Take for instance the famous Lotus 49. First introduced in 1967, it set the Grand Prix world on fire, winning its inaugural race and ushering in the DFV age. Lotus kept working on and improving the 49 model, adding spoilers and aerofoils throughout the late 1960s. They even continued using it into the 1970s, long past the introduction of the much upgraded Lotus 72. Their final entry for the 49 was the 1971 Alton Park Spring Trophy non-championship race for driver Tony Trimmer. One could argue that the 49 changed dramatically over those years, but at its core was the same design and arrangement. It was too good to simply throw away. This is something seen all throughout racing history, but the further back you go, the more prevalent it was. Once a good design was created, it was raced and raced again both by factories or private entrants, buying something a little older, which could still give them a shot. And that brings us to the subject of today. One of the greatest and most beautiful Grand Prix cars of the 1920s, the Delange 15 S8. I've featured this French beauty before. Introduced in 1927, at the start of the new 1500cc engine regulations, Albert Lurie's nimble, low-slung chassis paired with a twin-supercharged inline-8 was driven to unprecedented success at the hands of ace Robert Benoit and went on to win all five Grand Prix of that season. Famously, the 15S8 was seen as so dominant, Bugatti, already predicting the results, pulled their entries from that year's Italian Grand Prix. They say success looks good, but I'd wager the 15S8 had its looks from the start. But as the story goes, having accomplished all there was to do in racing, Louis Delange pulled factory support at the end of the 1927 season. Relegating the Delange story to a one-season wonder, a flash in the pan, the definition of blink, and it's gone. But predictably, or else we wouldn't be here today, that wasn't the end for the beautiful machines. The 15S8s were still cutting-edge technology, and upon closing up shop, offers from drivers, teams, and series began emerging to get a hold of one of the four examples built. So in 1929, Louis Chiron showed up to Indianapolis with the 15S8, chassis number four, the only non-Miller or Duesenberg in the field. Chiron qualified the French oddity in 14th and finished a strong seventh, completing all 500 miles, as was the custom at the time. The car then made its way back to Europe after the 500, where Robert Senecal, who'd been badly burned by early 158 designs in 1926, entered chassis 4 for the 1930 and 1931 French Grand Prix. Senecal piloted the car solo in the grueling 10-plus hour events, but finished an impressive 6th and 5th, respectively. After suffering an injury in an accident later that season, Senecal sold 15S8 chassis 4 to British royalty. Earl Howe, who kept it as a backup to the Delange, already in his stable. But during the Monza Grand Prix of 1932, Howe crashed his primary Delange into a tree. Lucky to survive, but totaling the machine and making chassis number four his primary going forward. Howe raced the car in various events over the next years to moderate success, before ultimately selling it in 1935 to young, up-and-coming British driver Richard Seaman. Dick planned to race the car in Voiturette races in 1936 and had famous Italian racing engineer Giulio Ramponi upgrade the car to then modern tech. Ramponi removed weight and stiffened the suspension. He added a larger supercharger and of course upgraded the brakes with quote, modern hydraulics. But the car largely remained as it was in 1927. Delange's design was still competitive with cars a decade on from its introduction. Seaman unsurprisingly found quick success with the 15S8, winning three Voiturette races, most notably the 1936 Donington Grand Prix, which caught the eye of Mercedes team manager Alfred Neubauer. And the rest, as they say, is history. That was enough to secure old Dick Seaman a seat with the Silver Arrows for 1937. And this is that car, 15S8 chassis number four. It's been brought to life in a set of Corsa by user 42. This is 42's second car, a fitting evolution on the wonderful 1928 15S8, released just a couple years ago. And it's every bit as beautiful and well-made as the original. 
Included is the car as it was run by Seaman in those 1936 Voitourette races. And sitting behind the wheel, it all looks very familiar. But as was the case in real life, this model includes the upgraded suspension, supercharger, and brakes fitted by Ramponi, which turned the rather tame but elegant driving experience of the original into a much improved and sporty one with the dubbed Seaman Special. What's clear is the care and attention to design and history of the automobile with 42's creations. This chassis actually still exists and makes appearances at historic events from time to time. So due to the wealth of photos and information on the car, 42 has been able to create something extremely authentic. And so here, what we have now is a perfect example of how exceptional racing cars truly were in the early days of Grand Prix. Enhanced, modified, and raced for years and years past their introduction, but always constantly making improvements. Let's see just how gracefully the 15S8 is aged. So rolling out of the pits, I'm at Donington Park. This is a 1938 version of the Donington Park circuit. It would have been the same one that Dick Seaman won at in 1936. And a great track that's been out for a set of Corsa for quite a long time from Jim Lloyd. The perfect place, obviously, to drive some of these old 15S8s. And I'm in the original 15S8 that 42 released, the 1927 version that I took a look at a couple years ago. Uh, and I absolutely love this car, but I figure I'll do a few laps in the 1927 version here, and then we can compare it to Dick Seaman's special and see what all those upgrades really did to a car like this and how a Grand Prix car aged over a 10 year time span back in the 1920s and 30s. the hairpin here and head underneath the bridge. Donington Park looks a lot different in the 1920s and 30s. A much different circuit than it was or than it is these days. It was completely reconfigured through a few parts, but you will notice some of these corners the same. This part of the track is still roughly in the same spot. We'll come up to McLean's, I believe it's called, down a first. Just done a nice siding out lap, but this car is my favorite 1920s car to drive. I love all of them, but this one is the right amount of speed for the grip and power and everything you can get in such a nice groove driving this car and it's one I've come back to quite a lot compared to all the others we'll head through now coppice and onto the back section of the course and famously the house that sits on part of the course gotta love the details like that but we'll throttle it up here on the outlap and a shift just before we get into the yellow range on the RPMs. This car has about 170 horsepower, give or take. It's impossible to know exactly how much power a car like this was outputting from race to race. I'm sure it changed quite a lot. But around 170 horsepower from the inline eight will allow us to get up to a pretty good speed. But the tricky part about driving these cars, and it's very true in this one, is braking and slowing down for corners. I'll jump off quite early on this lap. But we'll come down to the Melbourne hairpin and you can see how tight this one is. An absolute thriller and uh, a daring place for spectators to stand around the outside, I'd say. Other than that, once you get used to the brakes, the amount of grip the car has, even with these bicycle tires on it, is quite high and, and perfectly paired with the engine. But we'll head back towards the start finish now and I'll try to put a little gusto into it for the second lap. Up and over the rise, not quite enough speed to get some air there. Come over the line though and start a little bit of a lap. Get it down to first for the first corner. Actually a little bit hot coming into there. It's hard to judge the speed sometimes, but get on the throttle step the rear end out there and now head under the bridge in Hollywood corner and head towards the S's up to third gear want to get a nice late apex here it's off the throttle for quite some time and snake it down through this part of the track of course the same and come down to the hairpin Get it down to first gear for this one. Use the engine to help slow the car down. Engine braking is in full force with this car. We'll get it up to second as we'll wind our way into the forest. You gotta love the natural surroundings of race courses in this time. This car would have raced on all types of surfaces, especially in the 1920s, gravel and dirt and pavement and everything in between. 
but it's very much at home on these nice paved tracks. This track itself has a lot of bumps and it feels amazing in a car like this. But break it up here, down to first gear, a little bit hot coming in. Try to scrub off some speed. You can't do a lot if you brake late. Cut the track there. Now we'll wind it onto the back stretch and see what this thing can really do. Up to second. Get it up to third, right as it hits the yellow. 7,500 RPM or thereabout. Rush underneath the motor banner, 120 miles an hour in 1927. Get it up to fourth gear a little bit early. 130. See what we max out at. And it's all chicken game to see when do you want to start braking. We'll come over the rise here and slam on the brakes and use that engine aggressively to downshift and get it slowed down for the hairpin here at the bottom of the hill. Down to first. And it looks like you almost have to stop the car. But even then, missing the inside apex. Get on the throttle early. Walk the car out. There we go. That's what you like to see back up the hill. This should be an okay lap, I would think, but we'll do another one in it too. Over the rise where the Mercedes would leap off the ground in the years to come. Come across 221. I know I can do a little bit better than that. Down to first gear. Right to the edge of the track. It's so much fun to do. I'll keep it a little bit tighter this time. I was a slow through the S's, I think over the center line of the track. You want to keep it wide through the gate, but then curve it in towards the exit because there's the apex, very late. Check it into the second S using all of the grip that the car has in the rear and then some. show for the spectators they'd all turn out for a single car going around in these days Whoa, right out to the edge on the dirt a bit it's all right you use the engine and the throttle to help turn the car a lot you can see how much we're sliding through the corners but it really really helps turn the car so you want to get all your braking done with these older cars in a straight line down to first gear there and then as you turn in off the brakes and on the throttle even before the apex because you'll find the car just turns a lot more as I almost stare at my death in that wall but now get it up the gears you might try to leave it in third this time and really ring it out and see what we can get up to it was 136 last time through third gear then 136 miles per hour in 1927. Go well into the high RPMs, 134, 5, 6, 7, 8, just 140 there over the crest, but now all of the braking down to first gear. Come down to the Melbourne hairpin. Still not quite getting the turn in right. A little bit slower through the exit there. Put some throttle into it though and head to the line. I don't know if this will be better second gear trying to keep the track and the line short so we come over the crest and stare at that start finish come across the line 220.5 so improved about a second there off my last time so much fun driving this car this is one of my favorite cars for a Seto Corsa and uh, always love the excuse to drive it but now we get to hop into the much improved 1936 version and just see what Rampari was able to do to this beauty So fast forward your clocks 10 years into a much hot rotted out, I guess we could call it, version of the 15S8. This car has seen a lot of action at this point. It's participated in the Indianapolis 500. It's won a handful of races, raced in many, many Grand Prix, and of course those fantastic races in the 1920s. So basically a historic vintage car at this point, but it's been improved. And so Rampari with Dick Seaman improved quite a few things about this car. The engine with a larger supercharger, we should have a bit more oomph. In fact, it outputs about 20 more horsepower on a good day. 
according to different specifications. So getting close to that 200 horsepower mark. And the car has been lightened, so the power to weight is a bit better. You can already feel that a little bit. And then stiffer suspension, a little bit more modern of an idea of how the suspension would be. Of course, the tracks in 1930s, even the 1930s would be much more improved in surface technology than tracks were in the 1920s. But as good as all of those advancements sound, I think by far the biggest thing about this car is gonna be the brakes. Modern, modern of 1936 hydraulic braking system was vastly improved. So we'll get it on the straight here and I can already tell it's gonna be very easy to be a lot faster than the 20s version. But accelerate away already up to fourth gear and we'll actually use fifth gear I think here down the straight. But a much sportier car. And in my limited driving experience thus far, it is a lot of fun, but already gonna break the top speed and I'm not even pushing it. 141, two, three, we'll see how fast we can go. Could we get 150 on the next lap through? We'll come down the hill though. But to totally recalibrate yourself for braking distances and things, I think we're gonna be able to push it much, much deeper. We'll get it down to first gear. Almost easy to slow the car down now comparatively. I absolutely love doing this with vintage cars because if you drove this one in a vacuum or if you had just been driving a more modern car, this would feel so archaic. But now that we've driven what we came from, we can really enjoy what we've got now as we'll redline it a bit coming over the line to start our first flying lap. I'm still using very much the same braking markers as I was before. We're gonna be able to push those way back. is just about half accelerator trying to get the car to turn in there we go come through the s's just avoid the curb on the inside and throttle down to the hairpin and go quite a bit deeper on the brakes only down to second gear as so i lock it up a bit oh, i really slide the car in a lot of oversteer on braking there barely caught that one but head into the forest now to adjust your brain to driving a car, which is so different from the one we just drove and yet so similar. But rocket towards, try to break a bit later here, right at the top of the crest maybe, down to second gear, and get a good run onto the straight. Just listen to the sound of this. Supercharger whining as we go over 120 miles an hour. Fourth gear now. We'll get it up to fifth as we crest here. Flat out still. Gonna easily break our speed from last lap. Last car, 140 there. So we'll approach the Melbourne hairpin. And where do I break? 150. Get it down to second or fourth, third, then second, then first. Oh, and it almost stops on a dime. A bit late on it there all over the wheel but I was able to get it slowed down which is very fortunate it was a fast entry we'll round the hairpin though and head up the hill I think we're easily gonna smash that 220 by quite a margin and it wasn't even a good lap but we'll come across the line there we go 208.5 my god right back onto it hard to control the drifts in this a much more erratic car. I think that's owed to the stiffer suspension. Although it makes it faster, it makes it harder to drive, and you can see why drivers in this time period liked the softer suspensions better, but they weren't as fast. All right, coming down to the hairpin, try to do this a bit better this time, down a second. Still locking up the rears and gonna go around. All right, keeping it out of the walls, but I'm gonna do a couple laps here to uh, get it in tune with this one and come back and show you really what this thing can do.
you join me a few laps on, a little bit older, a lot wiser, and a few more near-death experiences, but I'll try to put a lap together here as I come over the crest, get it up to fourth gear. This car rewards a nice, smooth driving style, and I'll try to give it that. Down to second gear for the first corner. It's the trickiest one for some reason for me, but get on the throttle. I think it's the late turn in that gets you right out to the edge, the clutch slip. So we over rev a little bit there. Now try to keep it nice and tight as we'll head towards the S's. And past the gate, little curb on the inside. Just want to get the end of it. Try to miss the one to the left there. Don't run too wide, two wheels on the dirt, it's all right. Down to second gear. But you need to get all your braking done in a straight line as we give it a nice hop through the hairpin up to third under the bridge. 42 talks about in the description for this car how trail braking is really tough in it and I absolutely have experienced that. It's what caught me out last time. Down to second gear into McLean's. You still want that same driving style somewhat of getting on the throttle as early as you can through a corner, get the braking done before you turn in, but it's much more punishing if you do it wrong. To get a little late there on the brakes, slide it in and then onto the back stretch. We'll see what kind of speed I can get up to. This should be an okay lap, I think. Fourth gear then. Easily able to outdrag the 1927 version and hitting over 150 miles an hour before we brake. Fifth gear. come over the crest and try to spot some sort of braking. 150 miles an hour, there it is. But then hard on the brakes, car kicks sideways. Get it down to first gear. So easy to lose the rear into here. It's a do, but I'll slide it around all over the wheel. But able to hold on to it, there we go. Throttle out of the corner. And head up the hill towards the start finish line. It's gonna be just a little bit quicker, I think, than my fast lap so far. It is 106, 1 1.4 seconds up, not too bad. I did one slightly quicker lap, so we'll lock it up into the first corner, but man, such a different driving experience. And like I said, I think it's the parameters of the car. We're just really pushing what this car design was able to do, and it makes it a, a pretty hectic driving experience to go fast. Uh, but still some familiarity there, but it's almost this progression that would bring us to those higher powered Mercedes and auto union cars. So, so cool and something that's unbelievably fun to experience in a sim. Forty two has made another really special and fun car here. It's a great experience to be able to see what something was like earlier on with the impressive 27 version of the car, and then try the car as it was towards the end of its racing life after all these improvements and really appreciate that progression. So I think I said it while we were driving, but if you just jumped in this 1936 version of the car, Dick Siemens Special, you wouldn't really understand everything that went into the car. Maybe it's just a fun Grand Prix car, or maybe if you were coming from something more modern, you'd look at it and just notice its flaws and how underperformant it was compared to something much newer. But coming from where it started, coming from the car that really took the racing world by storm, gives you that full appreciation and makes this car itself so cool. I know I can't get enough from this time period, so I hope it's something that you enjoyed as well, and I can't recommend these two cars enough. If you're new to it, I would absolutely start with the original 27 15S8. I think it's just better behaved overall and a really, really nice driving experience. But then once you get used to that, you can crank it up and try to master this Dick Seaman special. It's a lot of fun. So thank you for watching. Thanks to 42 for creating these awesome machines. This is GP Laps, and I'll see you all again next time.